Well, good afternoon. I'm Sarah Tolles. I'm a curator in the Department of American Paintings and Sculpture here at the Metropolitan, as well as the curator of the USS St. Gaudens in the Metropolitan Museum of Art Show. Today, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all. Thank you for coming in out of the sunshine. Um, I'd like to thank, from the, at the start, Joseph Lowe, who is Associate Museum Educator for Lectures and Symposia, who's done a terrific job of putting the program together today. Also, our funders for the exhibition, uh, the Eugenie Prendergast Exhibitions for American Art, which are generously underwritten by Warren and Jan Adelson, who are longtime friends of the American Wing, as well as the Lawrence Levine Charitable Fund. So today I've got a, a whole hodgepodge of, of things I want to cover. Um, I want to talk about some recent activity with St. Gaudens, culminating in this exhibition. I'm going to walk through some of the concepts behind the show and also take a look at St. Uh, Gaudens' interactions with the Metropolitan during his lifetime. So 2007 was the centenary year of St. Gaudens' death, and that spawned a number of events, including scholarly symposia. Um, one of the, the biggest events, probably the biggest at the time, was the premiere of the film Augusta St. Gaudens, Master of American Sculpture, which um, had its first screening, the world premiere, at um, the Hopkins Center at Dartmouth College in Hanover, New Hampshire, um, close to St. Gaudens' home and studio in Cornish. Um, this film was written and directed, produced by Paul Sanderson, who's here today in the audience, and went on to have a number of national screenings in cities where St. Gaudens has major monuments, including Boston, Philadelphia, Washington, Chicago, and it was screened here at the Met. Um, interestingly, and quite a coincidence, it was also screened today on um, Channel 13 on Philippe de Montebello and Paula's On Sunday art show. Um, so if you happen to be able to be in two places at once, you could see that. Um, I'm, it's also going to be shown on PBS nationally on December 27th, and I'm happy to say copies are available here at the Met. As you can see, it's already out on home video. St. Gaudens is having his moment at the Metropolitan as well. Um, as many of you are undoubtedly aware, in May of this year, we reopened the Engelhard Court in the American Wing after several years of renovations to the space. Um, the, the overarching concept was to turn what was a garden court with some sculpture in it into a sculpture court um, to show our what is arguably the greatest collection of American monumental sculpture um, in much more um, congenial viewing conditions than before. Um, by now, I would think most of you are familiar with the image at the left, which has been our publicity image for the phase two of uh, the American wing. Um, out on the street banners in, in the newspaper and magazines um, with the great St. Gaudens Diana, our, our cast. Uh, she's become somewhat of a landmark or an icon in the courtyard, um, remaining in her spot in the center. And then on the right, um, a photograph that tells you a little bit about what we're trying to accomplish in our renovations, which was not only to present the art in a more beautiful way, but also in a more logical way. And so we were able to um, do things like pair the John Lafarge welcome window with St. Gaudens's and, um, mantelpiece for the Vanderbilt House and his later Amor Caritas and look at the concept of the ethereal female figure and classicizing garb um, sort of cross media. We also were fortunate to be able to time the um, spring bulletin this year that's mailed out to museum members with the opening of the exhibition. Um, what curator wouldn't love having a print run of 135,000 um, for the subject? This as, is also serving as the exhibition catalog. And as you can see from the banners um, on the front of the museum earlier this summer, the courtyard opening was followed by the opening of the St. Gaudens Show on June 30th, which is currently in the Wolf Galleries in the American Wing. Now, just to give you a little bit about uh, background about the concept of the exhibition, um, who was St. Gaudens? Just most simply put, and we'll get in, into his career a little bit more, but um, he is certainly the most important 
and accomplished late ninth, uh, sculptor of the late 19th and early 20th century in this country. The show includes 80 objects, 45 um, from the Metropolitan's collection, works by St. Gaudens. And what um, I wanted to do was to tell his career through the lens of the works in the Met's collection as well as some related loans. Now, 45 pieces, um, is, it's a substantial amount, I'm, but I'm always humbled by the fact that at the St. Gaudens National Historic Site, they have 10,000 works by St. Gaudens. So um, we, are, we are second only to the site. <laughs> this is um, the only American sculptor we could do a show like this based on the museum's holdings. Uh, but it is one in a series of shows that's taken place over the last few years that is dedicated to artists in the American wing which we have uh, really deep holdings. Um, for instance, John Singer Sargent, Thomas Aikens, Mary Cassatt, and Louis Comfort Tiffany, always a popular one. Now, a couple of installation views from the exhibition. Uh, one of the things that I had to struggle with was um, the fact that, of course, we could not bring the public sculpture in from outside. How did we deal with the question of the public monuments? And um, the solution was to commission photographs of um, major monuments and pair them and deal with them in context of related works. So for instance, with the standing Lincoln, we have the uh, bust of Lincoln on loan from the St. Gaudens National Historic Site. And then with the Sherman Monument below, the figure of victory, um, and over here is the bust uh, of Sherman from 1888 and then in the back, which of course is not terribly visible, the, the head of victory. A subtext of the show, in, in addition to tracing his, his life and works, if you will, is how the Metropolitan came to acquire its St. Gaudens holdings. And here are amongst the uh, two of the earliest that were acquired by the so-called St. Gaudens Memorial Committee in 1912. This was a committee that was formed after St. Gaudens died with a couple of purposes, uh, one of which was to raise money um, to purchase works cast from original plasters from Augusta St. Gaudens, um, St. Gaudens's widow. And um, here we see on the left the bust of William Tecumseh Sherman, which served as the basis for the head in the Sherman Monument. This is a, really a tour de force of naturalistic modeling. Um, that's on the left, and then on the right, the more delicate portrait of Robert Louis Stevenson from 1887, the large 36-inch version. These were works that were cast, as I said, especially for the Met, and on um, the Stevenson here, which, of course, you can't see, but um, it says, made, replica made for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Aspet 1910. Aspet was the name of St. Gaudens' home in New Hampshire. Well, through the, uh, about the 1930s, the Met steadily acquired works by St. Gaudens, um, but like most of historic American art, there was a dormant phase, um, only to awake in the early 1970s, when um, with the centennial of the Metropolitan Museum and the upcoming bicentennial, the nation's bicentennial, there was a lot more attention devoted to American art. And um, the renewed attention to the sculpture collection can be credited entirely with predecessor of mine, Lewis Sharp, who's now the director of the Denver Art Museum, and the fact that we were undergoing this major um, building project, uh, building the original version of the Engelhard Court, which opened in 1980. In 1985, we were fortunate to acquire what we like to call the crown jewel of the Metropolitan's American Sculpture Collection on the left, the Statuette of Diana with its um, electro gold electroplated surface, um, a reduction after the large version, uh, which formerly was on Madison Square um, Gardens Tower. That was in 1985 and came in to us from Lincoln Kirstein, a co-founder of the New York City Ballet. And interestingly, he had a sort of a side fascination with American sculpture and wrote books, several books on St. Gaudens, on Ely Nottleman and William Rimmer. Um, on the right is a terracotta portrait of Davida Clark, which came to the collection in 19, or sorry, 2004. Um, she was St. Gaudens' model and mistress for many years, and um, he modeled this portrait of her in 1885 
and what we can do in sort of these, which then served as the basis for the portrait of Diana. So what I'm getting at is that um, we can make these nice comparisons, this extremely private work on the right, which was given to her as a love token and came down through the family, um, and then also the more public Diana. We also can examine St. Gaudens's creative process in this exhibition. Um, anyone who spends any time working on him knows that he was an endless tinkerer and a compulsive perfectionist and, and works, um, his projects often spread out over years and years. What he often liked to do, especially in his smaller bas-relief projects, is to exert uh, or refine parts, elements of one portrait and, and um, make a, a separate new composition. And this is the case with portrait of, uh, on the top of Richard Watson Gilder, his wife Helena de Kay Gilder, and their son Rodman, which was modeled in Paris in 1879. After St. Gaudens returned to the U.S. in 1880, he um, took the portrait of Rodman and um, created a separate portrait, and, and I like to think of it as a head floating on a field of bronze, really. Um, we were, these are both pieces that have come into the collection within the last few years. Um, they came down directly from the Gilder family, and um, were, each of them is interesting um, sort of material-wise because um, St. Gaudens rarely gave away plasters as gifts, but he gave this plaster to the Gilder family. The separate portrait of Rodman on the bottom, we have documentation that he was, he cast this, this sculpture in New York and he was very pleased by what, what he called the quality of the cast on this side of the pond because it, um, at the time the American bronze industry was really in its infant stages. Now another thing we can do is to discuss his creative process in the context of the public monuments and this one, the Standing Lincoln from Chicago, uh, which was unveiled in 1887 is particularly timely because of course this is the bicentennial year of Lincoln's birth. And um, we recently acquired on the top uh, right the life mask and hands, or one of the two hands that that were cast um, in 1860 by the Chicago sculptor Leonard Wells Volk. Um, how St. Gaudens ties into this is because when he got the commission for the Lincoln, he um, quite coincidentally saw a plaster version of this mask and two hands on um, the table of an artist friend of his who happened to be the son of, of Leonard Wells Volk. And he raised funds to purchase these casts and to give them to the Smithsonian Institution and set up a subscription fund where 33 individuals and institutions each purchased sets. And um, from, he was involved in the casting and if you get up close to these objects in the show, you'll see that both on the end of this hand and then on the bas back of the mask um, are inscriptions in St. Gaudens' very distinctive lettering style. So we were able to bring these in because these served in the creative process for the Lincoln. He used these, the, the mask as the basis for the portrait of Lincoln in the, in the monument. And then also I um, borrowed, as I said, from the site, this portrait of Lincoln, which was actually cast after St. Gaudens died in 1907. His widow was um, quite a shrewd businesswoman and cast more than 25 different models. Um, including those that hadn't been cast during his lifetime, um, such as this one. Now this show really, I, I hope, or I like to think this show has something for everyone. Another segment of, um, there's a whole segment of the St. Gaudens aficionados, the coin people as we call them, who are um, primarily come to St. Gaudens through his um, 10 and $20 gold coins, which were um, modeled just before he died. Um, in fact, he did not live to see the high strike versions which um, were cast in, in the months after he died and are argue, well, were his most important work in the late years. These, um, I'm showing you the obverse and reverse of um, examples that are on loan from the American Numismatic Society. I, I brought in loans um, when I thought that they could really enhance um, the story of the objects in our own collection. And in, in our case, I have to say that 
we only have um, what are known as business strikes from 1910 and 1911, and these were executed in far lower relief um, than these much more beautiful coins. So needless to say, I wouldn't mind acquiring something a little earlier. But let's go back to the beginning. I feel, you know, I always am looking. Um, March 1st, 1848, St. Gaudens was born in this, this humble little house in Dublin, Ireland, the son of a French father and an Irish mother, a shoemaker and a seamstress, respectively. They came to the U.S. Um, when St. Gaudens was just six months old in 1848, like so many Irish of the time, and settled in, on the Lower East Side um, in what was very much a lower class um, working neighborhood, moving around to several different addresses before settling on Lisbonard Street, which is in what is now known as Tribeca. His reminiscences tell us of youthful exploits. He, he wrote um, his reminiscences while he, at the end of his life while he was ill, um, that were later published by his son. Talks about street fights, canings in school, running races, taking Sunday outings to New Jersey with a whole nickel to spend, which was a small fortune to him, visits to the theater at Niblo's Garden, and of course, youthful crushes. And I'll just read you one little passage. In addition, of course, he says, at this time there developed the first heartbeats of an intense passion for a curly-headed angel named Rose. She must have been seven, for I was about nine. I confess to being, at the same time, in, intensely in love with another angel who lived further down the street, the daughter of a shoemaker. Well, at age 13, he was apprenticed to Louis Ave, who was a French émigré cameo cutter, who St. Gaudens later called an old-time hard taskmaster. He um, had a studio on Broadway, which was then really the hub of the retail district in New York, and St. Gaudens worked for Ave, um, carving these fashionable keepsakes, both in shell and in stone. And on the right is his earliest documented work, which is in the Metropolitan's collection, a portrait of the uh, New York attorney, John Tufts, from about 1861. And what's really remarkable about this piece is, well, when you think about it, he was about 13 or 14. Um, but it was, it was modeled posthumously, so he, didn't, he wasn't able to have someone sitting for him. He was basing it on photographs. And what um, makes it challenging is that it's much easier to render a profile portrait than a frontal portrait in sculpture. And so I think St. Gaudens rose admirably to the task, working from photographs. Um, when you see the piece in the show, oops, um, just take a look at this eye. You can see that the pupil is sort of wandering off into the corner. So he was getting it, and there are little beautiful little touches like the wisp of the hair, but um, he was still young. Well, St. Gaudens called his time with Ave a miserable slavery, and um, he went after that to work with a second cameo cutter named Jules Le Breton, who he said was entirely the re reverse of Ave, except that he also sang all day the way um, Ave did, but he was much more of um, an avuncular presence in St. Gaudens' life. Now, um, when St. Gaudens was, before he started his, his cameo cutting time, his father moved his shop, um, his father became quite a successful uh, cobbler or, or shoemaker to the, to the Nouveau Riche, the Astors, the Belmonts, the Morgans, and other prominent New York families. His shop was on 4th Avenue and 21st Street. And what's significant about that is that um, here's the shop. But right here is the National Academy of Design that what was, um, had opened in 1865, this, this um, what was called, a, referred to as an, a neo-Venetian uh, doge's palace. And St. Gaudens began his academic training both taking evening drawing classes at the National Academy as well as the Cooper Union. Um, he would work during the day and then go off and take classes at night. Now this is a total aside, but it is a bit interesting and fun. Um, right in the neighborhood where St. Gaudens' family lived at the time um, is the Saint Augusta St. Gaudens Playground, which I visited yesterday for the first time. Um, and it was dedicated in 1996 and uh, with not only these gates, but also medallions, excuse me, that were modeled after St. Gaudens' works, and here's the, the $20 gold coin 
Um, it says there, there are basketball, volleyball courts in addition to the playground. I can assure you St. Gaudens never played basketball, but he did like golf and fencing. Now, in many ways, St. Gaudens' coming of age parallels the Metropolitan, so I want to play this out a little bit, both um, as they, they both grew to become institutional and individual cultural forces at the end of the late 19th century. The Met was just beginning, as, as um, it was founded in 1870, just beginning to get its feet on the ground when it uh, moved in 1873 into the, what's known as the Douglas or the Kruger Mansion, which was at um, 128 West 14th Street. And um, this painting by Frank Waller, which is in our collection, shows the entrance hall with loan, um, neoclassical sculptures on loan. Um, the only one we can identify now is this big bronze portrait bust of William Cullen Bryant, which was lent to the Met um, sometime during the 1870s, and believe it or not, is still on loan to us today. Um, <laughs> some housekeeping needs to take place. Uh, what was going on with the Met at that point was really haphazard collection, collecting because there was no, um, there were no funds for acquisitions until the turn of the century. Everything came in by either by gift or bequest, meaning that it was really quite a random um, beginnings of the collection. Now, St. Gaudens, too, was establishing himself during the 1870s as a professional, pre sorry, professional sculptor. We're just going to fast forward over his time in Paris between 1867 and 1870. He spent um, between 1870 and 75 in Rome, and at that point, he undertook his first great work, the Hiawatha, uh, which is on view in the Engelhard Court, which he modeled um, based on Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's epic poem, The Song of Hiawatha from 1855, which was a fodder for a lot of artists at the time. And he, he boldly proclaimed that Hiawatha would amaze the world and settle my future. He was not um, short on self-confidence. So that was his big project in Rome. He came back to New York in 1875, and while he was lobbying for the commission for the monument to Admiral David Glasgow Farragut, he completed very little independent work. He did work um, in really in the spirit of what we call the American Renaissance or the Gilded Age, um, doing collaborative projects with other artists, including working for Tiffany and Company, uh, modeling elements for presentation silver, including five of the six medallions for this portrait vase, uh, which was given to William Cullen Bryant on the occasion of his 80th birthday. Um, interestingly, this piece was the first um, piece of American silver to enter the collection in, in 1877. And then also in 18, uh, during the 1880s, St. Gaudens, once he secured the Farragut Commission, headed back to Paris where he worked on the Farragut um, until 1880. Well, 1880 was the year that the Met relocated to Central Park that spring um, into its first of uh, many buildings here on, the, on our campus, if you will. Um, the Calvert Fox structure, this should all be, this should be familiar to you. This is um, visible in the Petrie Court. And on the uh, bottom of the screen is a wood engraving from August 1880, which shows what were known as the modern sculpture galleries, which if you think of the Lehman Wing today, it's the space right between um, the medieval sculpture court and the Lehman Pavilion. Um, you can see several pieces which have entered our collection. Um, the first piece of American sculpture here, Hiram Powers, California, whoops, wrong one, um, here. And then this is William Wetmore Story's Medea. Well, spring 1880 found St. Gaudin still in Paris, exhibiting his model of the Farragut at the Paris Salon. He then had the sculpture cast in Paris and returned to New York that summer, um, where he spent the next year squabbling with the Parks Department over the placement of the Farragut as well as the appearance of the base. But in May 1881, this sculpture was unveiled in Madison Square Park, and it was considered then wholly novel in the context of American monumental sculpture. Um, it set uh, sculpture, I mean, it really is fair to say it was, it was such a bold departure on a wholly new course and announced St. Gaudens as the poster child for a new movement in American sculptures, really striking away from neoclassicism. 
St. Gaudens was based in New York between 1880 and 1897. And during this time, there were a number of um, documented interactions he had with the Met. Um, here's the, this is uh, the first case study, is 1882, when he lent a plaster of Sarah Redwood Lee, she appears on the far left here, uh, which he modeled in 1881, for, to a loan exhibition. Um, how the Met filled its galleries in the early days was by, by prevailing on artists and collectors to lend examples of their works for these ongoing installations. Now, it was predominantly um, neoclassical marbles, which were becoming more and more unfashionable, so why not lend them to the Met instead? Um, well, of course, the Hiram Powers California, as I mentioned, and Cleopatra, which was a gift to the museum in 1888, which had been on loan for many years. Um, we don't know the circumstances, how long the, the Lee portrait stayed at the Met. Um, I think it was probably pretty short-lived, but uh, we do have a plaster version in the show that's on loan from Chesterwood, Daniel Chester French's um, estate, which um, St. Gaudens gave to him. So I like to think, given French's role here at the Met, there may have been some relationship. Um, in 1886, St. Gaudens contributed the children of Jacob Schiff to the Society of American Artists exhibition, which was held here. Um, it, this was an ivory tinted plaster. I'm showing you the bronze version on, uh, which is at the St. Gaudens National Historic Site. This piece earned high praise. It was given pride of place in the exhibition galleries and um, praised for its decorative um, aesthetic, which St. Gaudens had, had moved more and more towards um, this, this sort of festoon of acorns and, and gar the garland. Um, and then also just the treatment of the children's clothes and the modeling, which goes from very low sketchy relief to higher relief. Um, St. Gaudens, interestingly, was frequently compared with painters, portrait painters, um, rather than with other sculptors. And uh, this work, in its large scale, especially elicited comparison with paintings by John Singer Sargent and William Merritt Chase, which were also in the show. By 1887, St. Gaudens, his, his reputation had come of age. He was no longer just a local sculptor. He was a national sculptor. With the unveiling in the fall, um, in October, of the Standing Lincoln in Chicago, and in November on Thanksgiving Day of the Puritan in Springfield, Massachusetts. Both of these were um, executed in collaboration with, with the architect Stanford White, and both of them um, earned him a lot of uh, critical praise in national publications. So by then, he was very much part of the cultural fabric of New York. He was the leading American sculptor, prominent in the arts community and um, also a very charismatic and popular figure. He was never um, at loss for friends. He professed to be quite shy and introverted, but in, in reality, he, had, um, he was blessed with many, many friends. Uh, this is a painting by a good friend of his, Kenyon Cox, which um, was first painted in 1887. I'm showing you this copy from 1908. Um, in the Metropolitan's collection, unfortunately, St. Gaudens suffered a major studio fire in 1904 in the original burn. But what, what this painting is, is it's a portrait on a number of different levels. Not only, of course, is it a portrait of St. Gaudens with his distinctive profile and his, he, he was a redhead, um, reaching out to model a portrait of William Merritt Chase, the um, popular portrait painter of, of the time. Um, so it's also a portrait about artistic process. You, you see in his hand, he's holding a wad of clay, his sponge here, and his modeling tools. It's also a portrait of the contents of his studio, his principal studio here, which was at 148th West 36th Street, um, which is the scene of this photograph. St. Gaudens was, was a club man. He, he, he was a member of the Century Association and the Players Club. And from the early 1880s, he held these Sunday afternoon smoking concerts in his studio. He was a lover, a lifelong lover of music. And these smoking concerts were held for the cultural elite of New York. And um, as the photograph notes, so here's Cox, who painted the portrait. Uh, Richard Watson Gilder, who was the editor of Century Magazine for many years and St. Gaudens' greatest champion as a journalist. Um, Brander Matthews, the Columbia professor of literature. Here's St. Gaudens peeking in the background, and then Stanford White here. 
Um, Cox said that, uh, quote, everybody in the literary or artistic world that comes to New York seems to be brought there as a matter of course. Well, it wasn't only men. Um, there's a, Ellen Terry, the English actress who was a friend of St. Gaudens's, came to one of these smoking concerts until she wrote later that she was driven from the room because she couldn't, the smoke was really just too much for her. Um, in 1888, St. Gaudens began teaching at the Art Students League. He was deeply committed to paying it forward um, and mentored many of the great sculptors, this sort of the second generation of late 19th century sculptors who worked both in his studio as assistants or um, as his students at the Art Students League. And here he is in a, a modeling class, um, sort of hiding in the back behind the armatures. Um, I love this, how the, the model here is assuming the pose of the figure um, that they've all been working on. St. Gaudens also took on an increasing role as an advisor for cultural organizations, including the Met. Um, this, this horrible Xerox of a, a letter um, is from Henry Marquand, who was the president of the Met at the time and appears in this portrait by John Singer Sargent, um, informing St. Gaudens that he has been elected to the Special Committee on Casts. And because he need, will serve on this committee, he also um, has to be elected as a fellow of life for the museum. The, this, committee, this cast committee was established to choose plaster casts for the collection um, and to raise funds to the, acquire them. Well, I did a little research on St. Gaudens' role on this committee, and I can tell you that he was a most inattentive member. He, I think he, he went to one meeting. And maybe that's why he, out of guilt, financed the cast, um, this pl plaster cast after the German sculptor Peter Vischer, his King Arthur from about 1521, which is in the High Church in Innsbruck. And if you were to ask me why he chose that particular sculpture, I have absolutely no idea. And of course, um, like our whole class collection, it's, it's met its demise at some point um, over the years. Now many, um, I shouldn't say many, but a number of objects in our collection from the 1880s and 90s have the intriguing credit line, gift of several gentlemen. And um, St. Gaudens was one of several gentlemen on several occasions, including here, this portrait or painting called The Rain by William A. Coffin, probably not a very familiar name. Um, none, nevertheless, it was completed in 1889. This tonalist landscape was a prize winner at the Society of American Artists exhibition in 1891, and the following year purchased for the Met by the likes of Henry Marquand, Benjamin Altman, St. Gaudens, and Stanford White, among others. And I thought, why did St. Gaudens get involved in this? But he and Coffin, who was also a journalist, were, were close friends, especially later in life. St. Gaudens also was involved in memorial efforts for fellow artists. This is a portrait by the American Impressionist painter Dennis Miller Bunker, a portrait of his wife. Um, Bunker died in 1890, just two months after marrying Eleanor Hardy Bunker, and um, funds were raised to uh, purchase this, this um, portrait for the Met by St. Gaudens, Stanford White, and the architect Charles Platt. Well, it's interesting, out of this, this effort, St. Gaudens and White got um, a com the commission for Bunker's tombstone in Milton, Massachusetts, but Platt married Eleanor Bunker in 1893, so he got, he got the best of it. Um, another memorial effort involved the sculptor Olin Warner. He was St. Gaudens' contemporary. You hear much less about Warner than St. Gaudens because he was not a monumental sculptor, but he did as much for American sculptor, sculpture at a certain point as St. Gaudens did. Um, unfortunately, he met his demise um, in a bicycle accident in Central Park. He was hit by a cab and um, lingered on for about four weeks before he passed away. And his widow selected the Met um, because as a public institution, it would enable students and lovers of art to make intelligent estimations of his work. So there was a committee um, in 1898 uh, under the aegis of the National Sculpture Society that raised funds to purchase 11 bronzes from the original plasters. And I show you here the um, 1880 bust of the American Impressionist painter J. Alden Weir. 
Another example um, of St. Gaudens' involvement with the Met is his interest in and familiarity with the collections um, here. It's evident since he used these objects um, for his own projects. Well, I have to hedge a little bit because actually the medal that I'm showing you on the right is by his brother, Louis St. Gaudens, who was slightly younger and also a very accomplished sculptor in his own right, but not a businessman. St. Gaudens tended to handle many details um, of securing the commissions for Louis, who would then produce these works. And this is an example where St. Gaudens asked the museum for a plaster cast after um, Oudon's portrait of Benjamin Franklin, which was modeled in 1878, came into the Met's collection in, sorry, 1778, came into the Met's collection in 1872. Well, St. Gaudens was so pleased with this cast that he asked the museum to give him two more. He was not um, shy about getting what he wanted. And this, of course, served as the basis of the profile portrait of Franklin for this commemorative medal. He also, um, in 1905, requested a copy of this painting on the left, a fresco painting from the villa at Bosco Real, which um, is a, from a town about a mile north of Pompeii. And the, they had been exec ex excavating these um, panels um, during the 1890s, and the Met acquired a cache of them in 1903. So they were very sort of of the moment um, in terms of what artists were learning about. And he requested that one of his um, students, Barry Faulkner, paint a copy for him, which he put in his studio, and also used as the inspiration for these figure, one, um, this figure of, of love for the Boston Public Library groups. Here's the, the library. Um, and uh, McKim, Mead, and White from 1895. Um, this is where St. Gaudens' groups were supposed to go. Unfortunately, he, he never completed them. Um, I, I mentioned earlier he was a sort of endless tinkerer, and unfortunately that meant that some things just never got done. In January 1902, St. Gaudens' Sherman Monument arrived from Paris, and St. Gaudens, who was by then living year-round in Cornish, New Hampshire, asked the Metropolitan Museum, well, specifically asked that its trustee, William Dodge, who was head of the Sherman Committee, if they would mind housing the Sherman here uh, while it went, underwent um, assembly and gilding. Um, the director at this time, Louis uh, Chesnola, was reluctant to give permission because uh, he was a collector of antiquities and had gotten in some hot water in the early 1880s about the authenticity of these pieces, and St. Gaudens had spoken out against him. So he, he wasn't feeling so warm and fuzzy about uh, St. Gaudens, but, but as Dodge wrote to Chesnola, St. Gaudens is older and wiser now and wants to be our friend. It is the best thing in life to make good friends of enemies by kindness and tact. And so the sculpture came here. But St. Gaudens wore out his welcome when he asked, um, it was put in a shed. When St. Gaudens asked to have um, a big north window cut in the roof of the shed, that's when Chesnola said, no way. And he took the sculpture, St. Gaudens took the sculpture up to Cornish where he assembled it and gilded it. It off, uh, came back to the Met, actually, right before the piece was dedicated in May 1903, where it was um, set up in a courtyard and with additional refinements to the gilding. Um, I'm showing you two views of the sculpture from 1904, just after it was unveiled. Now, what I want to do is uh, briefly loop back and look at some works that came into the Met's collection during St. Gaudens' lifetime. Uh, the first one to enter was the George Washington Inaugural Medal in 1890. Two examples, um, as, as was customary, uh, two examples were given so that the obverse and the reverse could be shown at the same time. Um, this was the official souvenir for the centennial of Washington's inauguration down at Federal Hall. There were 2,000 bronzes made. And the, um, coincidentally, or not, the chairman of the, this Washington Centennial Committee was Henry Marquand, who was the president of the Met. These, these men all seemed to overlap on various committees, and he was the one who gave two examples to the collection. During the earliest years of the um, Met, and even up to now, artists have involved, been involved in the formation of the Met's collection. Indeed, um, along with 
the sculptor John Quincy Adams Ward on the left, uh, Eastman Johnson, Frederick Church were also founders of the museum. And Ward served as an unofficial advisor on the formation of the sculpture collection until he retired from the board in 1901. His place was taken by Daniel Chester French, who's best known to all of us as the sculptor of the seated Lincoln in the Lincoln Memorial in Washington. And he served on the board until his death in 1901. He was head of the trustees sculpture committee. Now at the time there was no sculpture curator, so in a way he's a predecessor of mine. And he was a great ally for living sculptors of the day. Um, when he went um, sort of to survey his domain, um, when he first took on his role as a board member, he realized that there were no pieces in the collection by St. Gaudens, um, and he was quite astonished by that. And so he embarked on a campaign to acquire works by living American sculptors, and especially St. Gaudens. And I'm often asked if St. Gaudens and French were competitors, and I would just say that they were genial competitors, but really quite um, friendly and had a lot of respect for each other. The first thing that French did um, was to get the New York financier and philanthropist Jacob Schiff to fund the acquisition of three works by St. Gaudens that St. Gaudens was allowed to choose um, to advise um, on what would he best or most like to be represented by, what, by, what would um, sort of get across what he was all about best. And he chose three portraits of children. The uh, portrait here of the Jacob Schiff children, which is on view in the Engelhard court, and two others, which I'll show you. And St. Gaudens at the time promised to supervise and finish the reliefs for the museum with his own hands under the most generous and favorable conditions. Here are the other two, the children of Prescott Hall Butler on the left, the originally modeled in 1880-81, and then a portrait of Homer St. Gaudens um, at 17 months, St. Gaudens' son. Well, these, um, as, as was the custom, were carved by the Picciarelli brothers, um, not carved by St. Gaudens, who actually disliked the feel of carving marble. Um, the Picciarelli brothers were six Italian-born brothers who had their studio up in the Bronx and carved many of the major marbles um, of the day, including these. And um, unfortunately, St. Gaudens died before they were completed, so he never fulfilled his promise of putting his hands to the work. They were completed by Francis Grimes, who was an assistant of St. Gaudens's and specialized in marble car carving. Well, I've often wondered why St. Gaudens, as what, what I would call a bronzist, chose marble rather than uh, bronze for these works. Um, and I'm not sure we'll ever know the answer, but they, the Met also did acquire what I would consider a more representative work early in 1907, this um, second study for the Head of Victory, which was sold in an unlimited edition after 1902. And what makes this, this one particularly special is that St. Gaudens was able to advise Daniel Chester French and the Gorham Foundry that cast its work on the surface appearance. Now just to finish out, um, I want to talk a little bit about posthumous um, efforts on St. Gaudens' behalf by the museum. Its really greatest tribute to St. Gaudens took place in the form of a memorial exhibition which um, was organized, and it always astounds me. Uh, you know, we spend three or four years pulling off these big exhibitions here. It was organized between October 1907 and March 1908. So just in a few span of a few short months, they um, arranged a loan show of 154 works and produced a catalog. This was all headed by Daniel Chester French, and the show was held in the Great Hall. Um, ironically, St. Gaudens once remarked, it may be a glorious Baths of Caracalla thing, but it's a damn bad place for the display of art. And here's his memorial show here. Um, it opened on March 2nd, 1908, and um, it's hard to believe it, but it was really a great blockbuster. When you have to, you, the, the, this concept of blockbusters really is not a modern phenomenon. I, I would say it was like the Jackie O dresses exhibition of its day. Um, it, the closing date was extended twice. The catalog had to be reprinted twice, and um, it was quite, quite the place to be. Um, for the exhibition, they included plaster copies after monuments. Um, 
as well as just one bronze monument, the seated Lincoln for Link uh, Grant Park in Chicago. Um, St. Gaudens never allowed his bronzes to monuments to be publicly displayed before they were unveiled, but in this case, an exception was made. There were also smaller works on loan from the original owners. Um, on the left is William Maxwell Everts, a bust from 1872 to 74, and on the right, a Bessie White's wedding portrait from 1884, the wife of Stanford White. St. Gaudens completed this portrait as a um, a gift to the couple and then paid for its translation into marble to settle a debt with, with White. Now both of these were in the 1980, no, sorry, 1908 show and both have since entered our collection coming in from descendants of the Sitters, um, the Everts in 1987 and the White in 19, 1976. Following the memorial exhibition, um, I'm not going to discuss the posthumous collecting of St. Gaudens' work because that really could be the topic of a, an entire other lecture, uh, but I want to assure you that St. Gaudens remained prominently displayed throughout the um, 20th century. Here are views from 1933 uh, where, looking down the Great Stairs, um, you can see the figure of Diana, our, our familiar icon, um, installed here on um, that plinth. And then um, this is the upstairs flanking the Great Staircase. These, these were the galleries for American sculpture, and here's his figure of victory um, from, from which came into the collection in 1917. St. Gaudens was also the subject of scholarly exhibitions. This is not the first show on St. Gaudens here. Um, there was the one in 1908. This is a, a small exhibition held in 1973. Um, same, same topic, basically, as the one now, St. Gaudens in the Met. Um, of course, fortunately, we've, we've acquired quite a bit of new material since then. And then in 1985, some of you may remember, the um, exhibition, uh, it was a major loan exhibition held in the Englehard Court, including, um, here we have the Admiral Farragut from Madison Square Park, um, which was up, taken out of the park and brought to the Met. And then um, here from St. Giles Cathedral in Edinburgh, um, the Robert Louis Stevenson Memorial. Well, what's next for St. Gaudens at the Met? Um, in, right now, as I'm sure you've noticed, we're in, in the middle of a major building renovation in the American Wing. And in two years' time, with any good luck, we will reopen phase three of our project, which is the second floor paintings and sculpture galleries, 21 galleries um, allowing our paintings and sculpture from the colonial period up through the early 20th century to be able to be seen on one floor. Um, we will have um, portraits, sorry, paintings hung with sculptures. Um, this, of course, has attracted a lot of interest um, with the project to um, do a reproduction of the original frame for Washington Crossing the Delaware. This will be at the end of an enfilade, a 125 feet vista onto to Washington Crossing the Delaware. And St. Gaudens will be prominently represented. Um, perhaps by then we'll even be able to add new acquisitions because I like to say in the case of St. Gaudens, we're always adding strength to strength. So thank you very much.